Welcome to the FNO InsureTech Podcast, a place where movers and shakers from all points within the insurance ecosystem gather and discuss all things InsureTech. We talk about how technology and innovation are affecting and driving change in the industry. Here are your hosts, Lee Boyd and Rob Beller. Buenos tardes, podcast world. Welcome to another exciting edition of FNO InsureTech. I am your co-host, Rob Beller, joined, as always, by my intrepid co-host, Lee Boyd. Hi, Rob. Lee, what's up? It is good to hear your voice. It's been a while. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, I think the past two podcasts you weren't on because you were... uh... I took a little vacation, Lee. You took a little vacation. Is that okay? Do you mind? I think it's okay. I didn't okay. say it wasn't okay. You seem very, uh, no. very upset about I'm it. I'm a little I'm defensive sorry. about it. Yeah, very, very defensive. Yeah. I'm sorry. I mean, that, can't a guy take a vacation? Well, a normal vacation. But I mean, you know. when you are when you are as unimportant to the organization as I am, <laughs> people send me thank you notes. <laughs> thank going you on for vacation. being gone for so long. So, uh, what did I miss? Well, you missed some exciting podcast. Did Very I? Very exciting. But I do want you to know that I really missed you being on here. Uh, it was it was it was hard to do these without you, and I'm glad you're back. Welcome Are you back. You're trying Rob. to tell me there's no replacement for me. There's no replacement for you. Our entire audience is is very unhappy right now. <laughs> Well, we didn't get any mail. Nobody was like, hey, make sure Rob stays away. They're all sitting there saying, boy, I wish Lee would talk more. And we didn't get any mail saying, man, I love it when Lee does it, you know, by himself. So We don't get any mail under any circumstance. No. There's no, that but, too. But we had some fascinating podcasts while while you were gone. One of them was Simply Safe and Farmers. Oh, Simply uh, Safe. How yeah. was that? That was great. We had a lease mm-hmm. lock. That was really interesting. They were both, they were great. They were, in fact, in fact... Uh, we're going to do whatever we can to get Simply Safe back on and talk about them and more partnerships. I'm cool, very excited yeah. about that. Yeah, and I was really actually very excited about Lee Slock, and sorry I missed that. It um, was fascinating. It was really, I mean, they're a billion dollar company. Yeah, but to be honest, I was busy doing nothing, self medicating. Oh, with alcohol. Well, that's one way to put it. Yeah. Do you know why I started with the particular uh, phrase that I used in the opener? I do. What? I do. Oh. I think I think it had to do with San Antonio. It had to do with San Antonio. And in uh, a shout out to San Antonio. A great place. I use that opener. And that's because that's where our guest is today. Jeff Radke, CEO and co-founder of Accelerant. A international company. He has, he, he's all over the world and he mm-hmm. lives in San Antonio. Mm-hmm. And we're going to get to figure out why he's there in San Antonio uh, but we're going to get to talk all about Accelerant today and what they are and how they're coming in to work with the data and to really help MGUs throughout the world, really. Mm-hmm. And talk about the small, medium business segment of the market. And what a hot segment. Lots going yeah. on with the SMB. Yeah. And um, that's where Accelerant plays and uh, apparently very well and, and very capably. And we're going to hear about that today. I'm excited. Me too. And so without further ado, let's get to our conversation with Jeff Radke, CEO and co-founder of Accelerant. Hey, everybody. We are here with a very special guest coming to us all the way from San Antonio, Texas. Jeff Radke, CEO and co-founder of Accelerant. Hi, Jeff. Welcome to our show. Welcome. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you with us. So your guys' company is located in London, but you're in San Antonio. How did that happen? We're in the midst of the pandemic, or perhaps hopefully at the tail end of the pandemic. But at the very beginning of the pandemic, my colleague suggested that everyone should go to where their passport said. Hmm. And uh, as you could tell by my accent, I'm American. So I beat feet back to Texas and... uh, I'm quite glad I did. I would have been stuck in that horrible corporate apartment for, what is it, 19 months now. Oh, yeah. Uh, So it was a good decision. So thank you, Frank. Good advice. Good advice. 
It just goes to show you, listen to your underwriter. Yeah, it does. Right. Now, uh, now he's going to be insufferable. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that's how we get guests is we compliment the next guest and then yeah, he or she comes on the show. It's right? good thinking. Good thinking. Yeah. Um, but it also makes sense that I'm in San Antonio in another way in that while the business was launched in the UK, serving the UK and Europe in, say, September of 2020, we launched the business in the U.S. and started serving uh, customers in uh, the U.S. in 2021. So it makes sense. Yeah. Let's start with uh, the big question. Tell us what is Accelerant, uh, what the heck you guys do, and what the company's about. Sure. Accelerant was founded with an objective that sounds rather grandiose, but bear with me and I'll try and break it down. But um, what we said is we wanted to make a meaningful improvement, a dramatic improvement in the commercial insurance space. And when we say the commercial insurance space and we say a meaningful improvement, what we really were focused on is the small to medium sized businesses not the jumbos, not the large guys, but small to medium, say 500 employees and less, uh, because they really get chewed up and mistreated by the insurance industry. They're sort of too small. They're just as complex often as a big risk. But of course, the premium is much smaller. And for a whole host of structural reasons, in the 30 years I've been in the business, it's sort of been perennially true that small to medium sized businesses don't get treated very well in terms of choice in terms of cost effectiveness, in terms of service. So if that was your founding mission, the question was, how do we make a difference? And what became clear is the way to really democratize the value chain for these insureds was to harness technology to shine the light of transparency. And in insurance, transparency really means exposure data. Okay. So we've spent, you know, every moment from the time we it was Accelerant was a twinkle in our eye to today, working on figuring out how to bring the best and most useful data about the insurance risks to the entire value chain. So as we looked, we being Chris Lee Smith, my co-founder and I, as we looked at the commercial uh, insurance market. What we saw over and over again is that the most customer-centric organizations were program administrators or MGAs or MGUs. And I know you guys are experienced enough to know what I mean. They tend to be just a little bit wide, but about a mile deep, right? Their, their niche, they really know, they understand. They understand distribution. They understand their customers. And that's who we wanted to align to. Because if you're going to improve things for the customer. You need someone who's really customer centric. So long winded way of saying that um, what Accelerant does is it picks a relatively small number of what we think are terrific MGAs, MGUs, program administrators, and we back them to the hill with what we call supportive capacity. I think the traditional market support of MGAs and program administrators, generally speaking, has been pretty, pretty poor. And we set out to fix that problem by addressing their problems, their being the, uh, the MGU customers. So are you a carrier? Yes. So we have an insurance company licensed in Malta, licensed in Belgium, licensed in the UK. So that covers that part of the world. And then we have an admitted company in Delaware and a non-admitted company domiciled in Arkansas in the US. And so these MGAs partner with you Talk a little more about this transparency. What do you mean by that? What are you, what are you being transparent about? So if someone asked me to describe especially the MGA value chain today, I would say it's inefficient, opaque, and unfair. Okay. And it's that way on purpose. It's so heavily intermediated that the intermediaries find that they can maximize their profitability by keeping it that way. So what we did is we just set out to do the opposite of that. We tried to make a really streamlined, straightforward, clear, fair, and open, transparent picture of the business. So the main where the rubber meets the road is predominantly on 
say the on average 200 or so exposure characteristics that we track on each policy. So if you guys are familiar with the market, and I know you are, typically a Bordero gets shipped around once a month, right? Right. And if you think about it, that Bordero hasn't changed much since the 1940s. Right. Right. I mean, they used to mail it. Except it's emailed now. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So now they email it. But I know for shame on me, but I remember as a young broker, I remember my job taking that Bordero that was in an Excel spreadsheet and saving it down into PDF so that no one could use the data. Huh. I guess to get back to the, the quick answer, what we mean by transparency is predominantly that exposure data. So everyone in the chain gets to see it. Our risk capital partners, our underwriters, our member MGA, that's what we call our customers, members, because they're members of our network. Everyone gets to see the same thing and they're all making decisions based on the same complete information. And that doesn't sound like much, but boy, is that a game changer. It's a real game changer. And so the MGAs that are members, you said that they're small to medium-sized commercial. What type of policies are they writing? Is it property or is it liability? Unfortunately, because of our spread, our territorial spread, most of my answers don't fit fit into neat little packages. So here's the neat little package. We sell in each country what a typical small business needs to buy. For example, in Spain, the EU is so heavily involved in the Spanish economy and every project that has any EU money needs a surety bond associated with it. So virtually every small business in Spain needs surety bond capacity, right? That is absolutely not the case in the UK. So in the UK, we sell employers liability because that's a required coverage, but it's very different. But generally, it's exactly what you'd expect. It's Property is about uh, just a little bit less than half. And then uh, liability of different sorts, whether it's general liability, public liability, professional liability, inland marine, and then surety. Cyber? No, sir. No, sir. Um, We have some partnerships where we can give our members cyber protection, but we don't feel like we've got the expertise or, frankly, the resources to deliver the okay, now it's happened, what do I do? Services that are so, so important. Right. So important. How long has uh, Accelerant been around? Accelerant started writing business in December of 2018. 2018, so not that long. I was looking online about us. You have uh, quite a few folks on here. I assume things are going well for you. We've been very fortunate. I think we were able to recognize and address a pretty broken part of the insurance industry. And the one thing that's true about the insurance industry is, boy, it's big. Yeah. So if you if you get something that works in a meaningful area, like small commercial business, you can grow relatively quickly. And I guess what we're most proud of, I think, would be the success that our members have enjoyed. I mean, these are really high quality people that they've been at it for years and years. These are experienced blood and guts guys. And what we do is we almost take, I feel like we take the handcuffs off them. And we say, we trust you. We're going to treat you like adults. You're the expert in your field. We're here to support you. We can give you portfolio management. We can give you technology and analytical capability that you don't have today. But the important thing, sir, is this is your business. I want you to go out and grow it. And boy, do they. Boy, do they. Our members in their first two year of membership average 19.6% in annual growth. Wow. I mean, they go. So- the MGU is your customer? Like any good platform, or at least multi-sided platforms, we think we have two and a half customers. Okay. We have the MGU, which is where it all starts. But we also have the risk capital provider, whether that's a reinsurer or an ILS investor. They're also our customer. They need to get a fair shake and get their problems addressed as well. And when I said two and a half, the half customer in our minds is that insured and is, is retail it- broker. Mm -hmm. where by empowering that MGU to have the ability to be nimble in addressing the customer's needs, the retail broker and the insured is getting a better solution. So if everyone, I think everyone likes to wake up in the morning and think they're making the world a little bit better. And uh, on the good days, uh, Accelerant likes to think we're making the world a little bit better for everyone in our value chain including the insured with better choice, more service. 
So if a MGA comes to you and says, Hey, we want to be a member here. I mean, is it, is it open to anybody or is it strict? Are there certain guidelines you're looking for? There sure are certain guidelines. I think I'll be able to do this in the order of importance. Uh, <laughs> underwriting driven. Um, so our members are underwriters. When you cut them, they bleed underwriting. That's the first and most important thing. Second, most important thing is the type of business that they write. It has to be, again, small to medium sized focus. If we had were approached as we were with someone who wanted to do general aviation, that's not really a great fit because of the limits that are required and the volatility associated with that. So a small to medium sized commercial bent is important. That's number two. Number three is a profitable track record. And we try to be really enlightened about that. I've worked in places where a track record meant this company for the past five years. Whereas we try and be a little bit more open-minded where if a team and a, or a team leader can prove that she's been profitable at a different place for three years, we're more than happy to listen. And then the last thing is they have to have the right mindset. And here's what I would say. An MGA that becomes a member of Accelerant will not make as much money in the best outcomes of someone who cuts who writes against a carrier, they get canceled, they find a new market, they get canceled, they find a new market. If someone wanted to pursue that strategy, uh, we've set up our incentives to discourage that. So they have to have this notion of this, we're getting married. We think of it as uh, the difference between a 40-year-old married couple versus uh, two kids in college. Unfortunately, the traditional market is so brittle, those relationships begin and end so fast that I think it's to the detriment of everyone, but especially the MGU. That's fascinating. You said earlier, it's all about the data. And we hear that a lot. And we hear that more and more and more. You appear to have a technology, Accelerant Insightful, which is uh, your platform. Tell us a little bit about that. I, I suppose that is kind of the core of all of this. Is this what brings everybody together and kind of the, the hub? I would like the, you to keep answering all the questions. <laughs> you no, know, but that's exactly right. It, it's what brings everyone together. Uh, it's what provides everyone the same view of what's going on. And it's what provides the insights both to the MGA, to ourselves, and to the risk capital uh, provider. So for example, on some level, you can think of Insightful as a big matrix of expected values for each product. And then what when the month goes by or the week goes by, we tend to look at what the actual values were. Well, how many claims came in? Or how many claims were for escape of water? Or how many applications do we get? Of those applications, how many do we bind? Right? So we in really, really granular detail, we have expectations for how a product's going to perform inside our member MGU. And Insightful is comparing those expectations to reality and essentially pointing out the variances. Now, today, that has moved us ahead uh, leaps and bounds mm -hmm. to, to be able to be organized and see those variances and the humans go out, our team, and, and seek explanations for the most important ones. What What's showing great promise is machine learning algorithms, which are prioritizing those anomalies. And they're saying, hey, look at these first, and these seem less important. Boy, will it drive scalability, I guess is the best word for our team. But the important thing is in insurance, almost anything, if you catch it early, becomes an annoyance or a stub toe. Yeah. It's never a disaster until three years have gone by. And that's what, among other things, insightful stops you not knowing for three years. Just to clarify, an MGA is going to come to you and you're going to partner them up with an MGU. Is that how that works? You're, the, you're connecting them? You know too much. I use MGU to be a uh, geographically ambiguous term okay. or agnostic. Right? I get it. So in Greece, there's no such thing as an MGA. If you're called an MGA, it's like a penalty box of a regulatory classification. Okay. In the U.S., it's also not great to be an MGA, right? Um, so I, I try and use MGU rather than the whole list of program administrator, blah, 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 blah. So 
all of our members are making underwriting decisions in their niche within their box. And then it, what Insightful allows us to do, all of us to do, is watch how the book develops and watch for style drift, whether it's intentional or not by accident, right? Mm-hmm. About what did we want this book of business to be and what is it becoming over time? So if those MGUs are using your platform to underwrite these policies. No, sorry. They are using their own policy administration or agency administration systems. Mm -hmm. Our system, our insightful, reaches into theirs to get the data. And then what we find is most of our members find the analytics and the views from insightful to be somewhere in between easier and more, forgive me, insightful than their sort of native systems. Where did this idea come from? Well, someone asked me uh, once, they were, they were being complimentary and they said, boy, it sure looks like Excellent has achieved a lot in a relatively short space of time. How long have you been working on it? And my answer was 33 years. Because in a way, each step of mine and the rest of the team's sort of career progression, we were either the worst age or the perfect age, right? We started when Marsha McLennan didn't have any uh, personal computers. No. Okay. Right? Um, and now we are where we are from a technology standpoint. So I guess what I would say is we have been frustrated as a team and, and our cohort, age cohort, we've been frustrated our entire careers about what we don't know or can't get. So I would say the idea of this has been percolating for a long, long time. I would further go on to say that while the utility of the system delivered is shockingly high, right? The usefulness is incredible. Mm -hmm. I would argue that it's not that crazy an idea like, whoa, you know, it's, it's not an amazing sort of flash of brilliance. What it is, is what you would have wanted to see. If you ran an electricity generating plant, you would have sensors all over the plant yeah, looking for things that are too hot, too cold, too wobbly. That's what we're doing. So I, I don't think... I don't think the concept is uh, crazy or, or uh, this flash of brilliance, but I can tell you, I'm, I don't think that it's been implemented anywhere else. And it hasn't been implemented anywhere else because the data and the technology wouldn't have allowed. So how did you get your hands on the data? The data was always there. It was just, it was stored badly and transmitted worse, right? So we came up with one fundamental idea, which was our members are going to be, they don't have to be cutting edge, but our members are going to be competent underwriters that really care about their risks. And then that means they will store the data. And here's the technology bit. No matter how dated their systems are, we can reach in and get it. And now it's on a modern footing where you can do all the tricks that the data scientists talk about. So we didn't manufacture data. What we did is we found the data that was being ignored. And now you're compiling that data, which which even makes it more and more and more powerful. Yeah, I think it does because, as we all know, that data points aren't particularly important in insurance, right? It's the, it's the overall sense or the distribution of anything that, uh, that has meaning. So the aggregation does make a big difference, and the big difference is dramatic increase in value. I agree. I, I want to turn a corner a little bit and talk about you. And you said, you know, this is basically 33 years in the making. Yeah. Well, let's r- just run us through your career real quick and how you got to Accelerant. Sure. So my joke, which of course isn't a joke, is uh, I was bred to this industry like a dog. My father worked in the reinsurance business. So in those days, in the time-honored tradition of nepotism, I was lucky enough to be given a series of internships all the way through high school and college with Guy Carpenter. I graduated from college with, some would say, seven years, not a full-time experience, but seven years of knocking around uh, Guy Carpenter, thinking about and talking about reinsurance placement. So I went on to work at Guy Carpenter from 1990 to 1996 as a reinsurance broker, working on large accounts, small accounts, property and casualty. Got a pretty good sense of And right around 1996, I felt like I was ready uh, to make a change and head towards more self-determination. So I switched from uh, reinsurance broking to reinsurance underwriting. 
And uh, I went to a company called Cat Limited in Bermuda was the first stop. That time period gets a little complicated because it's sort of hard to remember. Did I buy them? They buy, you know, there were a lot of combinations going on there. So Cat Limited, I'm quite sure, got bought by Ace at the time, Mm -hmm. became part of Tempest. And we went on from there. So I've worked at a number of different reinsurance companies in Bermuda, the last of which was a company called PX Re. I happened to run PX Re. PX Re had a uh, business strategy that was focused largely on retrocessional business. After Katrina, Rita, and Wilma, Standard & Poor's didn't like that s and I guess, didn't like the, that strategy. So we had to find a merger partner. We merged with Argonaut to make Argo. And then I, somehow, I don't know how the time went so fast, 11 years with Argo where I ran their reinsurance company for a time. I ran their syndicate for a time. I ran operations for a time. And my last assignment was to try and develop a European strategy. And you found a wife during that time, right? I think she would probably argue that the verb, maybe there's a better verb uh, than find. But um, yeah, I was lucky enough to stumble upon a a hidden gem Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in San Antonio. Okay. And and therefore the, the San Antonio answer. Yeah, right. Therefore, the San Antonio connection. So you're having a great career at Argo. It's it's really a reinsurance company, correct? Argo is mainly insurance. And that's what I learned a lot. I learned a lot about insurance by being at Argo. And so here's what was happening. We were, we, Chris Lee Smith, uh, my co-founder and I, we were pursuing a, a strategy pretty close to Accelerant at Argo. And then these stories always occur in a bar, I think, or at least mine do. So we were in a bar in Stockholm about 1230 at night. And uh, we said to each other that through no fault of Argos, it's just so hard, right? Because the company's not set up to just serve MGAs, right? The company's set up to do a lot of other things. And there are silos and competing for resources and competing for talent. And uh, Chris and I said, gosh, this would be so much easier if we were on our own. Uh, One thing led to another. Chris and I eventually resigned from Argo to pursue Accelerant. In the meantime, Chris and I met Altamont Capital Partners, our financial sponsor. Early on, we met, and thank goodness we did, because uh, they have been a great partner all the way through this. So let's talk about InsureTech. You consider yourself an InsureTech, correct? An InsureTech carrier? I do. Yeah, I do. We do. When we were talking in the couple of months before we had you on and and exploring, there was conversation about InsureTech 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. Tell us about your view of what was 1.0 and now 2.0 and 3.0. Share some of your thoughts there. I think it all started with distribution and it all started with distribution into the personal line space. And then I don't know if that's 1.0 or, but I think the next progression was some optimization, but only a little technology driven optimization inside the actual big brokers. Because again, I'm trying to answer your question in terms of what do I think made the biggest difference to the industry as opposed to what was the cool little thing off to the side. Right. So distribution technology, a little bit of of improvement as to how the intermediaries operated. Um, And then the next piece was uh, a a beginning of understanding how technology could make the distribution process better, even in commercial business. And then the next stage is how do we make the insurance company's operations and underwriting decisions faster, better? And I think we're stuck there. And I think it's a really tough row to hoe for the existing companies because I was there, right? I I worked in operations at at, at Argo. It's really hard to modernize that stack that we've all inherited Mm -hmm. from from the generation before us. Mm -hmm. That's really, really difficult. So I think what's happening, if you look uh, at what I perceive to be the most enlightened insurers and reinsurers, is they're all scrambling to have relationships with clean slate companies that are tech first or tech driven, because I think they think that transitioning the mothership is nearly impossible. What we're going to have to do is slowly transport 
from the mothership into the new rocket ships. So move the business, if you will? Yeah, move the business onto the new platforms. I don't think you can modernize the old platform. I, I think it's it's impractical how long it'll take. So what is Accelerant? Is Accelerant the new platform? Yeah, Accelerant is absolutely the new platform. Uh-huh. And, and notice what we did, right? We left those policy administration systems in the in the members exactly as they are. We didn't try to modernize those. What we did is we took advantage of the 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 improvements in technology and data management tools to go get it and bring it into a modern environment. Mm-hmm. Because uh, increasingly, I'm sure you hear this all the time, but increasingly, actually, the only thing that matters is the data. And everything else is sort of a frustrating annoyance, right? The whole technology stack, other than that data piece that I want to know right now about escape of water claims in the UK, is just friction, right? Yeah. Our friend Dan Moore says, the person that owns the data wins. I think that's probably right. The one thing I would say out loud is (laughs) the commercial insurance buying decision for a company without the resources to hire experts or to get the A team from Aon or Marsh or Willis or, or, you know, it is daunting. It is really daunting. Our average customer has to buy six policies right. to fulfill its governmental requirements, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you talk to them, I, and I know this is a cliche now, you talk to them and they say, I don't even know what the hell I'm buying. Right. I found an agent that I trust and I try and spend as little money as I can, mm-hmm. right? Um, So if that's the case, I think owning the customer relationship maybe puts you three quarters of the way to the winner's circle, and maybe the data gets you the last quarter. Mm -hmm. So what we believed in very strongly is the member MGAs have the relationships. They own that customer. Knowing what you know about the commercial side, we work a lot on the personal line side. What can you say about the personal line side in this same kind of concept? The most complicated personal lines and the most simple personal lines it has way more in common than the same comparison on the commercial side. Sure. So I think what that means, this isn't my area of expertise, but it's my observation. I think what that means is it means personal lines is an area that's absolutely perfect for data-driven, technology-driven distribution in terms of market segmentation, finding the right customer, bundling it with a bunch of other stuff, embedding insurance and all the the various physical products. It it makes all perfect sense to me um, on the personal side. And I guess that's the biggest difference because when you go to the commercial side, things get uh, almost unbearably messy. My last question for you is, when do you get to go back to England? Does that ever happen or... So I had, well, uh, boy, I have gotten used to not traveling, but funny enough, I was scheduled to go to England in two weeks. No, 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 a week. And I have to say, as I watch the, uh, as I watch the news, um, part of me wonders whether that's wise, but the governments, the various governments are starting to help make my decision in terms of how many tests one has to take. So I'm not sure if, if you're doing more COVID tests than you are meeting with customers, maybe it's a trip that doesn't need taking. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know if that's a new uh, if that's a new KPI or not, but mm-hmm. soon I think is the answer mm-hmm. for when I'll be back in the UK and in Europe. One of the things I, I really miss is the chance to actually be in person with my colleagues. Yeah. Um, uh, but also, uh, or in addition, um, we're really close to our members. Um, I'll bet you I saw most of them a couple times a year. So uh, cool. it, many of them I count as my friends. I hope they'd say the same. And I, I miss them. Did COVID accelerate Accelerant? Holy smokes, did it. And it did it for a couple reasons. Uh, no one could travel. So it felt like we got about 30 employees just free out of the ether in terms of if you take away all that airplane and airport time the productivity went way up. But more importantly, we're a pretty focused bunch and we're we're eye on the prize, right? Uh, everyone understands that if you make a decision today unilaterally and your objective is to do the right thing for the member, all of us, all, all of Accelerant is going to back you up. What that means is we're super decisive and super responsive to customers' needs. And I think the relative difference 
between the accelerant team and the rest of the industry was heightened in that period of uncertainty because a lot of the big companies weren't sure what they had authority to do, what they didn't have authority to do, right? Well, we congratulate you on your accomplishments. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And it's cool that you got to do it from uh, from the house. Yeah, that's right. With, with the uh, COVID dog barking in the background. <laughs> with the COVID dog. I have one of those myself who's yeah. uh, somewhat famous now as a result. We thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate the time and uh, for your people getting us hooked up with you. We scour the landscape of insure tech. And I have to say, your company and what you guys do and how you go about it is unique in all the episodes that we've had. And so we're, we're thrilled to be able to cover it and talk about it. We hope to have you back on sometime in the future to uh, tell us how things are going once the global pandemic is over, right. if it ever ends. Yes, right. Well, I'd certainly look forward to, to joining you again. I, I want to thank you for an opportunity to talk to you both. It's been, uh, it's been enjoyable. Thanks. As everybody who listens to our podcast regularly knows, I'm the cute one and Lee is the smart one. And so we have this video now that, that we use. We have a new platform that, that we're using. And so you have video. And would you say that that's it's accurate, that I am indeed the cute one and Lee is indeed the smart one? This is awkward. Well, it's not, not so all. bad. Here, no. Here's how you answer that question. It's very similar to the question about the dress or the trousers. Uh-huh. Right? You say, on the inside, you are cute. <laughs> And with that, ladies and gentlemen, (laughs) we will cut him off. Uh, Thanks so much. much, What a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Sometimes we have people on and we don't know exactly what it is that they do. And this is one of those times, but really it's pretty straightforward what he does and and what Accelerant does and, uh, and, and very interesting. Yeah, I thought it was a great conversation. Uh, and, and, and just like normal podcasts, I even love the after conversation mm-hmm. uh, after after we stop recording it. It's always great. Jeff is a really neat guy uh, with mm-hmm. a, a lot of experience, even mm-hmm. whenever he's talking about all of his past jobs. Uh, I mean, he has a wealth of knowledge that he can bring in and make uh, Accelerant great. He and his co-founder, very excited for him. Good job, guys. Good job. Good job. And and we thank Alicia Moss and Aldrin Muya, our intrepid producers, for making this podcast and all the other ones happen. Thank you. And thanks to Jeff Radke and his team for uh, bringing him today. And we thank you, as always, for being with us and being a part of this crazy experiment that continues to go on and march towards 150 episodes. Isn't that right, Lee? That is right. That's what Alicia told me the other day. 150. That's a lot of episodes. They said it could never happen. Mm -hmm. They said Mm -hmm. it. They said it wouldn't last. Mm -hmm. And they said, Mm -hmm. man, it's still on. And there's some people who listen to the podcast and say, how does it last? (laughs) (laughs) So we'll say to you what we've said 150 times or so before. And that is. Goodbye, everybody. (laughs) 